Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruven, speaking to you from south of Jerusalem here in the beautiful, holy, sacred land of Israel. Today is the eighth day of the month of Nisan, the first of your months. The year is 5784. It is April 16th, 2024. This coming Shabbat, we read Parashat Mitzorah from the book of Leviticus, beginning in the book of Leviticus, chapter 14, verse 1, concluding chapter 15, verse 33, this coming Shabbat, the Shabbat which precedes Passover, Pesach, is known as Shabbat Hagadol, the great Shabbat. There's a few different reasons why it might be called Shabbat Hagadol, which we'll talk about perhaps in a few minutes, but uh, in any case, that's what it is called. And... Um, Things are heating up here in Israel, and I suspect around the world. Uh, s s Monday evening, we begin the festival of Passover, Pesach, which literally means to pass over, because in Egypt, Hashem, uh, when he went from house to house to kill the firstborns of the Egyptians, any of the Israelites, any of the Hebrews that had slaughtered the Korban Pesach, the Passover offering, the Paschal offering, as they had been commanded uh, on the 14th, on the eve of Passover, uh, and had painted that blood on the posts of their doors, would be saved. Shem would see that blood on the doors and pass over their house. And that's how we have the name of Passover. Of course, who is the blood really intended to be seen by it was intended to be seen by us we our ancestors who we know for a fact painted their doorposts with the blood of the Passover offering because we're here today and they're the ones who saw they were the one who saw Hashem's promise of deliverance and that promise stands with us today with something we read in the Haggadah which of course is the telling of the Passover story uh, that we read and we discuss and we argue about every year in the Passover Seder because we are instructed by the Torah more than once to teach the Hagi to tell and to teach our children that we personally we left Egypt we were rescued by Hashem from Egypt not our ancestors of course they came out of Egypt but we also, you know, remember when I was a kid, they had these movies that they would show you in school called You Were There. And they would take a historical situation, you know, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and they would sort of create a, a, a scene, a, a script that would allow you to be sort of a participant, or at least a fly on the wall. You were there. Well, we weren't simply flies on the wall. We were there. We were among our ancestors who were taken out of Egypt by Hashem's outstretched arm and mighty hand. And there's one thing that we read uh, on the Haggadah every year, and it goes like this in Hebrew. And how does that translate into English? And it is the Torah that has stood, and it is this that has stood by our ancestors and for us. For not only one enemy has risen up against us to destroy us, but in every generation they rise up to destroy us. But the Holy One, blessed be He, Deliver us, delivers us from their hand. We witnessed this this past Motzei Shabbat, this past Saturday evening, Sunday morning here in Israel when at about 2 in the morning uh, we were on the receiving end of more than 350 uh, ballistic missiles, um, cruise missiles, and drones, suicide drones that were launched from Iran hours earlier because it takes a long we're not we don't we don't have a border with Iran we're very far from Iran there's no reason in the world for Iran and Israel to be enemies certainly not to be at war with one another 
but uh, Iran declared in 1979 when uh, the Islamic regime took over that uh, it was their goal to destroy Israel, and they've been working on it ever since. This was the first time that we have been directly attacked. But of course, there's been a proxy war, a shadow war, for many, many years, which has heated up recently. And of course, Iran claimed that this was in retaliation for a chief top, the top uh, coordinator of terror throughout the Middle East, uh, working for the Iranians. Israel took him out a week ago in Damascus. And so this was their retaliation. And Israel, with our incredible uh, defensive anti-missile systems and air force and with help from the United States and England and also Jordan uh, which shot down a number of incoming missiles uh, and apparently there was some cooperation also with Saudi Arabia and the Arab Emirates um, Israel was able to repel 99% of those incoming projectiles Nobody in Israel was killed. There was one serious injury, a Bedouin girl, young girl, 10 years old, I think, in the southern town, um, who is uh, has undergone operation. She's still in critical condition. And uh, there were more people, I believe, killed in Iran due to misfires. I think an entire buildings went up in flames when they were hit by missiles that uh, barely got off the ground. And in in uh, Rabat Daman, uh, the capital of Jordan, three people were killed. In Israel, there were no fatalities. Like I said, there was the one casualty, practically no damage whatsoever uh, in an air base not far from where I'm living, which was one of the targets. Uh, they suffered very minor damage in one of the runways, which was quickly repaired. Um, I, if you've seen pictures, photos of some of these missiles, they're massive. Uh, there was one that landed in the Dead Sea, and it was dredged out uh, yesterday, and it's massive. If any of those missiles had actually struck a target in Israel, there would have been massive casualties, massive damage. Um, Iran uh, initiated this attack with the intention to destroy, to kill. The fact that it didn't happen was a, a sign of Israel's um, preparedness of our military capabilities, defensive capabilities, of a, a, an alliance, a, a coalition of those, and there are many countries uh, in the Middle East who are opposed to Iran and feel threatened by Iran, and by Kadosh Baruch Hu. Yes, the Holy One, blessed be He. He is the real director of, of all. And it was His outstretched arm and mighty hand which stayed the attack, which deflected the, the missiles. Yes, we helped. We were participants, just like everything in our world. Um, when we participate with Hashem, the results are good. When we decline or refuse to participate with Hashem, then we pay the suffer the consequences. But um, uh, myself and my family, we went into a very nearby uh, bomb shelter because we don't have a safe room in our house. A very nearby bomb shelter where a number of uh, neighbors were gathered and waited out, uh, I guess it was about half an hour, um, while there were sirens in the air and you could see all sorts of things happening up in the sky. And this, much of Israel had the exact same experience, although I know there were some places where people, they weren't targeted and um, they slept through the entire event, didn't find out about it till the next morning, although Israel we had warning for hours in advance because it takes hours for these missiles um, to to uh, arrive. Because again, Iran is not a neighbor; they're far away. And some of these missiles, like the ballistic missiles, they actually go up into the out of the atmosphere before they come down. And uh, Israel was able to take them out uh, up out up there, out of the atmosphere. 
Um, so, but don't, uh, a lot of people think, okay, no damage was done, just like when the, the, uh, the Palestinians uh, fire missiles from Gaza. Oh, you know, Israel was able to successfully shoot them down. No damage was done, so what are you worried about? The question isn't the result. The question is the intention. And all these missiles are fired with the intention to kill and destroy. So we will be celebrating this coming Monday evening Passover. We will be celebrating our freedom, the exodus, our covenant with Hashem. And uh, it will be a very, at the same time, sublimely joyful and also very difficult Passover because we were not all free. We still have hostages in Gaza. We don't even know how many are alive today. It seems like every time that we try to get some kind of confirmation from Hamas, the number goes down. And there are many families who have people being held hostage. And so Passover freedom, it will be a very bitter, perhaps, uh, celebration. And, of course, the many soldiers who have fallen in combat and the many citizens who were massacred uh, on October 7th, their survivors will have, as they have been since those days, uh, will be challenged, greatly challenged um, by the holiday. We have to all support them and stick together and come together. And again, the only comfort and the only uh, answer is unity. And there again in Israel, those who are trying to shatter that unity. But fortunately, they have been met with tremendous opposition to their efforts and I am quite certain that their efforts are being coordinated and funded by outside sources that seek to destroy Israel but we shall prevail we shall prevail we have much to be happy about we have to be we have to focus on what we have and what we have is a society that rose up on October 8th and uh stood together and and hundreds of thousands of, of people ran to to put on uniforms and, and go to war to defend our country and and, and the hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand young Israelis that were abroad flew back immediately to return to their army units in order to fight. And um we're a strong society, we're a resilient society and we like like we read in, in, in the Haggadah. We, we've been through this in every generation. And, of course, in every generation, we hope that we, that we can only say those words that we said a few minutes ago in, you know, as a, as a memento to the past. But no, unfortunately, in every generation, uh, there are those who will rise up to destroy us. And um, it is a, incumbent upon us to again unite turn our eyes and our hearts to Hashem and uh, with Hashem's help uh, defeat our enemies what will be next well I'm sure Israel is going to retaliate one way or another uh, despite Joe Biden's uh, wish that we don't which is a, an absurd thing to wish an absurd thing for him to to say to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, don't, don't retaliate. What country on earth worth its existence wouldn't retaliate to an attack like that? Unfortunately, uh, the United States' current policy of appeasement only invites more violence. And the only way to deter violence is to respond forcefully. And Israel has to still has to finish the job in Gaza and we have to respond to Hamas and we still have the war in the north against Hezbollah so our challenges are great our determination is even greater and uh, we will win this 
whether it be today, tomorrow, uh, next month, or next year, we will win this. We will wind up victorious, and our enemies will be defeated. Uh, there's much mockery of the Iranians now in Arab uh, press, in Arab uh, media, uh, as their grand attack uh, seemed to be a tremendous failure as it was repelled in its entirety by Israel. So they are being mocked. They even posted the Iranian government uh, in their media, social media and, and television media were showing uh, video clips of a, f of a fire in Texas claiming it was Tel Aviv. That's how desperate they were to show uh, that they had accomplished something other than humiliating themselves. And of course the people of Iran have been strong supporters of Israel all throughout our war before and all throughout our war with, with, with Hamas and with Iran and they don't buy the lies of their own regime who they suffer from greatly. On the other hand, in the West, I see, you know, immediately popping up all these uh, protest groups, you know. Yesterday they were supporting uh, Hamas, today they're supporting Iran, Hezbollah, um, you name me a, a disgusting, depraved terrorist entity, whether it be a state uh, or a non-state, and I can show you who in America is going to be out uh, vociferously and violently protesting on their behalf. It's uh, a big problem. And um, America really has to start dealing with this if America wants to have a future. I'm more concerned about America's future than Israel's future. We shall prevail. America, I wholeheartedly root and pray for America uh, but America really has to right itself it seems to be um, rudderless right now and heading for very very dangerous waters so um, America get it together and American leadership show some show some strength You've been, for four years now, uh, bending over backwards to appease Iran, not responding to Iranian attacks on U.S. military bases and personnel, and when responding, only after giving Iran sufficient warning and basically firing at empty buildings. Uh, you've avoided taking on the Houthis and clearing the the waterways so so that international trade won't be interrupted you've avoided doing all these things hoping that everything's just going to work itself out but by avoiding this all you're doing is emboldening the enemies of democracy the enemies of freedom the enemies of what we call western civilization you might want to call it um, uh, what do they call judeo-christian civilization civilization built on humanity um, built on the rights of individuals and the rights of societies to live free and to prosper um, so I would think that the entire Western world would be in Israel's corner saying you know we have to end this but many of those Western leaders are either afraid of their own populations, especially the uh, Middle Eastern populations that have immigrated legally or illegally to Western countries in huge numbers in recent years. They're either afraid of them or they want them to vote for them. So they're going to bow down to them and bend over to them, as Joe Biden has been doing in America. So, you know, if your short-term interests as politicians outweigh your concern for the very civilization who you um, claim to be, want to lead, then you are heading, you are leading your, your nations, your societies uh, into very dangerous territory. 
Let's take a moment, and it's really not going to be much more than a moment, to talk about Parshat Mutsura. And Mutsura is a someone who has uh, been inflicted by the the ailment known as Tsar'at, which we always say is very inaccurately, wrongfully translated into English as leprosy. It is not leprosy, um, and many of its symptoms don't even line up with leprosy. But um, we began this discussion in last week's parsha Tazriya, and uh, of all the different parshiot, all the different Torah readings that we read throughout the year, I would say, I would venture to say that Matsura is probably the most obtuse, the most difficult to to understand. Well, not to understand. I mean, it all makes sense. It's all very in great detail. The nature of the affliction now in, in, in Parshat Matsura, they're not they, they open up Parshat Matsura opens up with the with the procedure for the the cure and and return to purification of someone who was who was had the sarat. And then it goes on to sarat in the house. But the it's not difficult to understand the, the, the words or the verses or what it's telling us, but the whole concept is difficult. If the concept of a, of a uh, you know, this affliction in the person's skin, and again, an explanation, traditional explanation, is that it was uh, the result of Lashon Hara. We talked about that at great length last week. It's a very important uh, concept. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it explains why one would get sarat, but we don't know. The Torah doesn't tell us that that's the reason. And but now, and then it goes on to sarat in uh, again last week's uh, reading in in person's garments. What's that all about? And now, Hashem says, when you get into the land of Israel, and you're in your stone houses with plaster walls, you may see lesions basically in your in your walls what i i would guess you know something that would resemble mild or mold uh mold or mildew in a very serious way and it's interesting that hashem says this awaits you you know we're gonna be going to the land of milk and honey a land with with olives and 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 pomegranates and wheat and barley and grapes and and dates a wonderful land with valleys and fields and mountains and, and, and rivers and springs and lakes, not too many lakes. Um, and there's also going to be this this illness awaiting in the houses that we live in. It seems like a funny message. And, and why? What exactly is the explanation for that? I don't think the explanation is no longer Lashon Hara. And again, our sages have grappled with this and um, present different possibilities, different explanations. But all in all, it is very difficult to to really wrap our heads around. And uh, so I would say that Parshat Mutsura is probably one of the parshiot that most uh, rabbis, most teachers, most people who are standing before an audience, before a congregation, and giving a Devar Torah, which is a short uh, Torah teaching, um, will either skirt as best they can, or you know, may talk about an allegory, or like last week, talk about Lashon Hara. Um, it's just a difficult. It's really difficult to to get into. Oftentimes. Uh, Tazria, last week's reading, and Matsura are read together in the same Shabbat. But this year, since we had a, a leap year, an extra Adar, 13th month, um, it was split up. So we have two weeks of, of these very deep and arcane subjects. Um, and before next week, when we read Acharei Mot, which uh, brings us back to our, our storyline, really, of the dedication of the of the tabernacle, the death of the two sons of Aaron, and the work of the Kohanim inside the tabernacle. Here in uh, Tazria and Matsura, we read about the Kohanim, but outside the tabernacle. With that introduction, let's read the first few verses of Parshat Matsura in Hebrew, and then in English. Again, we're 
of Leviticus, Vayikra, chapter 14, verse 1, Vayedeber Hashem el Moshe lemor, Zot tihye Torat ha-Mutsora b'yom tahorato, v'huva el ha-Kohen, v'yatsa ha-Kohen el mihutz la-machne, v'raa ha-Kohen, v'hinei nirpah nega ha-Tsarat min ha-Tsarua. V'tsiva ha-Kohen, v'lakach l'mitaher shte tsiporim chayot tahorot, v'etz erez u-shne tolat, ואזוב, וציווה הכהן, ושחט את הציפור האחת אל כלי חרס על מים חיים. את הציפור החיה ייקח אותה, ואת עץ הארז, ואת שני התולעת, ואת ש... את שני התולעת, ואת האזוב, וטבל אותם, ואת הציפור החיה בדם הציפור השוחה שחוטה על מים החיים. אוקיי, אני אסלאפ לרן היברון. read what I just read and more in English. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, this shall be the law of the Mitzora, the person uh, who has Tzarat, on the day of his purification. He shall be brought to the Kohen. The Kohen shall go forth to the outside of the camp. The Kohen shall look and behold that Tzarat affliction has had been healed from the Mitzora. The Kohen shall command and for the person being purified there shall be taken two live clean birds, cedar wood, crimson thread, and hyssop. The Kohen shall command, and the one bird shall be slaughtered into an earthenware vessel over spring water. As for the live bird, he shall take with it the cedar wood and the crimson thread and the hyssop, and he shall dip them and the live bird into the blood of the, two, of the bird that was slaughtered over the spring water. Then he shall sprinkle seven times upon the person being purified from the tsarat. He shall purify him, and he shall set the live bird free upon the open field. The person being purified shall immerse his clothing, shave off all his hair, and immerse himself in the water and become pure. Thereafter he may enter the camp, but he shall dwell outside of his tent for seven days. On the seventh day he shall shave off all of his hair, his head, his beard, his eyebrows, and all his hair shall he shave off. He shall immerse his clothing and immerse his flesh in water and become pure. We're not done yet. On the eighth day, he shall take two unblemished male lambs and one unblemished ewe, E-W-E, in its first year, three-tenth ephah of fine flour mixed with oil and one log of oil. Those are both measurements. The Kohen who purifies shall place the person being purified along with them before Hashem at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The Kohen shall take the lamb and bring it near for a guilt offering with a log of oil, and he shall wave them as a wave service before Hashem. It goes on f uh, uh, for, for much longer. Uh, it's incredibly involved the purification process. And if you are, as you very well may be, a little more familiar with the, the preparation for the ashes of the red heifer, uh, there's some similarity in that. We also, that also involves a cedar wood uh, wool dyed in crimson, uh, and hyssop, uh, as part of the purific as part of the purification process, um, and uh, as well as, uh, spring water, as well as, uh, maim chayim, pure waters. Um, what's it all about? You can research it on your own. There are, you know, uh, explanations and attempts at understanding and, and getting down to the bottom of it. Um, I I don't have those explanations on hand. I am uh, uh, very much uh, stymied by it. I think it, it sounds like a very beautiful, meaningful ceremony. And I'm sure there is uh, there is, you know, something real behind it. It's just beyond um, what I, what I can intellectually uh, un uh, grasp, um, but with that I'd like to make the point that um, sometimes we read things like this in the Torah and it just thinks, you know, what are they talking about here? This sounds like folklore. It sounds like magic. It sounds like, uh, you know, something, some kind of superstition. It's none of the none of those things. It was a real procedure done by real people that had a real effect. It really worked. Um, so there is something behind it. Um, just like there's something behind any of the other things in the Torah that, that uh, the, the chukim, the, those, 
those uh, laws, those ordinances, which are, God said this is how it works and that's how it works. Uh, there are those commandments like the red heifer, which is the, the you know, ultimate example of, of a, something that we can scratch our head all we want, but uh, and and grasp at explanations and, and come up with many understandings. But ultimately, the ultimate reason, understanding behind it, uh, eludes us. Our intellect just isn't there. Uh, this is God's God's reasoning, which is beyond our reasoning. So don't disparage or belittle um, what we're reading about here. It was serious stuff, and again, it seemed to um, be something that, that was in effect uh, at least throughout part, if not all, of the first temple period, this whole business of tsarat, um, but uh, not... Um, to a much, le much lesser extent beyond that. I mean, I say to a much lesser extent because there still were provisions and there still was a, a special chamber in the, even in the second temple uh, where the uh, Mutsara, where someone afflicted with Sarat would go to purify themselves before bringing their, their, their offering, uh, which we posted about uh, on, on Facebook uh, just yesterday. So you're welcome to have a look there to learn more. Um, so yes, the and like I said, that is the entire parsha is basically focused on this and the 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 the, the subject of the of the um, uh, tsarat in a house, which requires the the dismantling of the house if need be. Uh, it's a whole again lengthy process, and after discussing that, it discusses other sources of of bodily impurity. Um, so it really gets down to the nitty gritty, and all sorts of discharges which could r render a person impure, and and how we deal with that. Um, and again, this is all very relevant to the book of Leviticus, but the book of Levit Leviticus, Torah to Kohanim, uh, teaches us the responsibilities of the Kohanim and, and dealing with all these issues, even when it takes them outside of the tabernacle or outside of the Holy Temple, is the responsibility of the Kohanim. Um, they seem to be acting um, also as, as doctors, you know, in diagnosing and, and prescribing the the process, what needs to be done in order to um, overcome the tsarat. Um, and what can I say? More power to him. And again, next week we will be uh, reading about Achrei Mot, which returns us back to the to the main theme of of uh, the book of Leviticus. One other thing I'd like to say about about the Mutsura before uh, we conclude is that my gut feeling is that all these this malady, um, this impurity became revealed once the tabernacle was established. And the reasoning be, be, is that once Hashem's presence was so near and imminent, it was like shining a brighter light on, on our reality. And that brighter light re revealed things that otherwise we wouldn't have seen, that once revealed had to be dealt with. Wow, here's the music. I only intended to spend a few moments on the song. I think I spent a lot. Um, Passover coming up, this coming Shabbat, we read about the prophet Eliyahu and our Haftarah. And, uh, if I don't get to do a uh, temple talk before next uh, Passover, next e Monday evening, I wish everybody uh, Chag Sameach, Happy Passover. Thank you for being with me. Temple Talk. <laughs>